Okay, so the first thing is, is are these headphones okay to put on your head? Because I feel like you're a brain surgeon. You would know. I would know, maybe. And um, I'm not taking any risks putting these headphones on, and neither is anybody else in your show. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they're just headphones. Okay. Right? The funny thing about that is people ask me, do cell phones cause brain cancer? And if you look, like, last 20 years, the rates of brain cancer have not changed, but everybody's got a cell phone. And if you're still worried about it, we're starting to lean more towards texting and having them in our hands and not next to our our ears. It's a non-issue. What are these stories, though, that I hear about these women that hold their, their phone in their breasts? Like, they hold it, like, in between their boobs, and then they get breast cancer. That's just not true. It's just not correlated. It's just total baloney. See, okay. this is why I love having someone that actually is a doctor on the show, because I want to... I always... Every time someone says this stuff to me, like, hey, if you hold your phone up, you're going to... I'm like, there is... I always say there's no data behind this, but I'm, you know, obviously speaking as somebody that's not an expert like you. Yeah, but that's that's kind of the weird thing now, is if you say crazy stuff... You, there's so many outlets you'll get the headline you know and there was a thing like the laptops is going to cause problems with your junk and stuff like that see it's she like, yells at me all the time if my laptop's <laughs> on my junk I yell at him if his laptop's on his balls so I don't have yeah. to yell at him about that maybe that's foreplay that's just warm up I'll take that off my list it's a long fucking scroll I'll what take about, that off what about like um, electronics like there's a lot of people ripping their their wiring out of their house and going crazy what about that so that's that's interesting um, so the concept between that thought so I'll take you back to a story I my three boys were born in San Diego, and we were buying a house. There was one that was cheaper, and it was underneath these, like, heavy wires. You know what I'm talking about, like yep. the giant – it looks like a dinosaur with the, the big wire. So when you have electricity, it also creates a magnetic field. So it's like electromagnetic. So, like, you drive with your AM radio through certain spots, and it gets all staticky. So there is a connection between electricity and magnetic fields, and they had a sign if we were going to buy the house – that this may have some health effects. But you're talking about a monstrous amount of electricity at a distance, and even then it's not proven. But pulling wires out of your house, I don't, I haven't seen anything like that. I might be wrong. I'm just telling you, like, as of this moment, I haven't seen anything like that, and I'm in the cancer field. I'm a cancer brain surgeon. I've got a laboratory. We, we read about this stuff. Speaking about all that, let, let's go way back with you because, you know, we, before we turned on the mics, we were, we were t briefly talking about your background. How did you become a, basically a brain surgeon? <laughs> and, and, and you told me this, and correct me if I'm wrong, you said you were a security guard in Oakland. This has to be, this is a wild story. I, 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 I want to hear the whole, we want to hear the whole thing. Yeah, unpack well, that for I us. Don't, yeah, unpack, I don't know where to start with that. Like, so I grew up here in Los Angeles, and this is funny, like, I'm sitting here in Hollywood Hills. Everybody thinks Hollywood or the industry or whatever you guys call it, the business is Los Angeles. But if there's 20 million people from, let's say, the Valley let's say Ventura to San Clemente to like Inland Empire, I would say almost all of them are not part of the business or the industry. And so there's this giant world out there from Whittier to Compton to, you know, Van Nuys. And I grew up in that world. I grew up off the 60591. It's weird. Okay. Like you just know like where you live based on your freeway junction. And I drew, I drove through this area. I didn't know anything about this world, but I was starting to look at like universities so then I realized I want to go to a university that's not here because I wanted to get away from L.A. In the 80s, things were just tense. You know, there was, I mean, AIDS was popping up in San Francisco and there was a lot of gang stuff in L.A. It, just, it was just a tense environment. It may still be tense, but that was uniquely tense for me. I just felt like I needed to get out of L.A. to understand who I was. So I went to Berkeley. I got into Berkeley, luckily, and I didn't even check it out. I just was like, I'm going because it's not here. And what a magical place. I mean, I didn't have to drive. I love driving, but I didn't have to drive. Berkeley, Oakland, San Francisco, you take the BART, completely different vibe. People stare at you, it's not because they want to fight. People uh, are, they were, they would have like smoke outs on, on Berkeley as a campus and the cops would be like, don't, don't bother them. It was just a different environment. I'm not saying better or worse. I don't, I don't judge, I just want to understand. And when I was there, I, I, about a year or two into it, I was like, you know, I'm not going to class. It was semester based, not quarter. So you like had tests every like two months, so you could not go to class for a month and a half, cram for a test, and still sounds, like, sounds bounce like my out. cup of tea. I know. So I was that it was my cup of tea, <laughs> and I dropped out because I just needed to get my head right. I wanted to like bask in in the different environment. So I needed a job, and I there was a the dormitories are these big cafeterias. So I got a job there as a security guard. 
And, uh, you know, it wasn't violent, but I had a uniform and a hat, and it was just a different thing. But the trip was, like, I was sitting in class with people, like, with Chemistry 101 or whatever, and everybody's thinking about m making big careers. And then, like, two weeks later, I'm like, you can't take that out of the cafeteria. You know, it's, like, totally different role. And they, they would look at me sideways, but I never let that, like, I never got twisted about that. I was just like, whatever, man, this is me. I don't, I don't really care what you think. It's not my business. Um, but that's also where I met my wife. Um, she's from Guam. They don't really have a university, so she was one of the students going through there. And that's how we met. And so she was like, I met somebody in America, in Los Angeles, and uh, he's a security guard. And her parents weren't judgmental, her family wasn't, and then she inspired me to like look at it differently. And having a year or two being a security guard, I liked it. I was volunteering in San Francisco, I was partying, but I was like, it, it was losing its buzz. And so I realized I wanted to do something else. And that's when I went back to school. And were you always good in school? Were you, were you a good student? Yeah, I was always, sort of always lived a double life in Los Angeles. Like I was hanging out with the kids that were definitely not going to college. Um, and but I could just cram and and get the scores. And so, so I was like, like, we're like a student all so the time. So you're just naturally very very intelligent. Well, it, that's a different thing. Intelligence. I'm more tactical. Okay. I would be like, oh man, I, I would, if I memorize these 500 words, I can do good on this test. And that's what these colleges are looking at. It wasn't like I'm. I was a learned man, and I was. I had a photographic memory. I would just. I was strategic. Like they look at grades and they look at scores. Let me take the easiest classes and get the easiest A's. And let me cram for whatever this test is about so I can get to the next step. But it wasn't like, I wasn't the smartest out of the ones going to college. Um, and a lot of the kids that didn't go to college, some of them went to prison, some of them had trouble. When we were, they were, they were smart. I mean, they were, if they had been given the opportunity to go to a school or a good school or had the uh, gentle pressure from family or society or culture or parents to be like, this is important, they would have exceeded me. So it was like the first time I started seeing like, there's potential inside all of us. And just cause you get somewhere, you know, a lot of it is luck and, and opportunity that you're, you fall into. Not that you, I, I pulled myself up and I did this. But so like not anyone can be a brain surgeon. Well, that's a different, okay. so wild to me. Yeah, but that's different. So then when I went back to school, I got into medical school and I was not at the top of my class in medical school. Um, I wasn't really trying. Um, then my wife got pregnant and she was, uh, you know, she is a guy in oncologist. So it's a gynecologist who do robotic surgery to cut out like, uh, cancers in, in pelvis of, uh, you, of women. You, I said she's a gynecologist and you said, no, she's a gyne oncologist. So they start off with gynecology. Yeah. Then they do three more years of training to cut out cancers of the uterus and cervix and stuff like that. And wow. so we, we kind of fumbled into this stuff. But when I, when I was at, uh, in medical school, the first time I liked what I was doing was, uh, interestingly enough, when I saw them make an incision on somebody's belly who'd been shot. And, and we always think of the human body like cadavers, you know, or like that those body exhibits. No way, man. Even in the belly, they <laughs> opened it up, and it was like slithering snakes of bowel, and it was iridescent. And we're just talking about guts. I mean, I was like, whoa. The liver, it was just colorful. It was almost artistic. And then so I was like, oh, man, it's nice because – when you're a surgeon, it's you. Like, if you need chemotherapy or somebody needs chemo, it's the same bag of chemotherapy in New York as it is here. But it's not the same hands operating in New York as it is with me or here, right? So it's like, it's where your hands are your medicine. So I was like, whoa, this is like, this, I felt ownership. You know, who's, you know who also said something similar to this? Jason is Diamond. Dr. Jason Diamond. You know him? He's a fa facial surgeon here. He's and like and he, said like he, he saw a lot of facial trauma one time uh -huh. to study it. And he said like a light went off. And he's like, oh, my hands yeah. could do wait, it. Wait, you said something, though, that's so interesting to me. You said when you looked at it, like Michael just said, it's artistic. You you didn't look at it in a gross way. Like, when, if, if I, I look I at that, I'm going to pass out. Yeah, I'm going to die. Well, that's the funny. Okay, trauma surgery can be bloody. There's blood everywhere because you're rushing. But when you do surgery as a scheduled kind of thing, you have this like, it looks like a fountain pen. It, it, it looks like, a, and it's got electricity that shoots. So when you're cutting, you're snipping, you're controlling, it's not supposed to be bloody. And so that means uh. you can see the anatomy. It's, it's a window inside that's not, uh, you know, made opaque because it's filled with blood. Actually, you're sloppy if you're just leaving blood all over the place. So when you cut it open, it's not bloody. It, people think, oh, I'm, I'm scared of blood. No, it's actually, it's like, it's like a, 
you know, it's like opening a fruit basket and get all these different shapes and colors. And that's just the belly. And then later on, I saw like the heart and different things. So I wanted a general surgery. I'm scared of cutting anything. I don't care if there's blood or not. If I'm that's looking at, I, I'm not looking at this like a bag of fruit. I'm looking at this like, holy shit, somebody's body's And the open. cutting is just the beginning. Like that, that's where I tell people like, oh, the operation is six hours. The nip tuck, you know, where they show the blade. I used to love that show. But the, the, uh, the blade part takes what? 60 seconds. What are you doing inside for the other five hours and 59 minutes or whatever, right? So, what's like, the average length of surgery that you perform? Well, it depends like, on, terms, for in me, terms of duration. So, my I operate on Wednesdays is usually two four hour cases, but sometimes if it's a big case, it could be eight or nine hours. It wow. just depends on what the patient needs. And, um, that's the thing though the, the work inside cannot be imagined if you have not taken a look. I mean, the Exact uh, again. What are you doing for six hours in there? If cutting the if cutting the skin takes a minute or two, what are all the other things? And I think that's like where I like I love talking about surgery because I try to get people to imagine the incision is just opening the hood, and then you see you go to a Ferrari dealership or whatever Ford dealership, and they're rebuilding the engine. You can imagine that because you've seen it. We've looked inside when we were growing up, but similarly inside the body and inside the skull. Opening the skull takes 20 minutes. Some, the operation is four hours. What are you doing in there? What are you, I mean, what are you actually doing? You're like slithering around valleys and singeing vessels and sucking out tumors. And you're, there's all this work that is completely like sculpting. Like whether you got a machete and you're working on a totem pole or, you know, you've got an exacto knife and you're doing arts and crafts. There's a lot of like physical work in there. And some people are better at it. It's not the same... 1500 steps during those four, four uh, like for example if you're making a totem pole you might go f you might take fewer wax to make it uh, wax me to like you know yeah. hit to make it take form and so a surgeon that's good messes with the tissue less less picking grabbing less stretching less stabbing the the the, the less the body notices you the more perky the patient is afterward, the less the complications. It's like more are. precision. More precision, fewer steps, and then the patient is, the patient does better, and that's like that's cool. That's the competition I'm in. It's like a way for me to be like super competitive, but do it in a way that's like cathartic, and I feel good because my complication rates, my patients do better than at the other centers across the world. So it is competitive, but it's not me against the patient. It's me. The better I get my patient to do. That's the competition I have at City of Hope where we want, I want to be the best. You're like competing with yourself in a way. Yeah, and actually the other surgeons. I want my patients to know he crash lands the least when he flies to the moon. But hmm. I, I still crash land, but less than the other pilots. So here's a weird question. Maybe you get asked this a lot, but I've always wondered this as someone who could never do what you do. The first time that you perform brain surgery after college i don't know if you have to go to college all the way or you do it while you're in college how much anxiety do you have what if you fuck no, that up i know that's a trip so the way it goes is like this college is about four years medical school is about four years you got to eat eight just to get your medical degree but you can't touch a patient just by doing that then you got to do residency which is three to eight more so you're 16 years out from graduating high school by the way you guys he looks like he's 25 and a model but <laughs> go on i'll let them google you 47 years old <laughs> And just hitting my stride, actually, it feels good. This is a good age for people who are, who are thinking 47 is old. I'm sort of just It's a good it. thing to mention. So many young people that listen to the show, they have anxiety. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I know they're in their 20s. You know, they, uh, they like, like you said, you're, you're like in your prime now, 47. Yeah, and actually, don't be – I'm going to get back to that, but what, you, what you're saying, but don't be in a rush. Like, rush – I tell my kids, like, rush to, like, finish and have a job from 21 to 71. Oh, my God, man. It's a long time. I started, got, I started working at 36. I'm 47. I'm already feeling like, man, I've been doing this a while. So take time, take pauses, uh, diversify your skill set, yep. launch a little later. Uh, that would, that's my advice to my own kids. But the first time the brain surgery thing, so this is a trip because I had seen, so in medical school, four years of college at Berkeley, well, six, because I took two years off in the middle, then at, at USC Medical School, I, I saw heart surgery. It's what you expect beating muscle you're like okay it's flesh it's bone it's you go to the butcher shop it, 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 you've seen those colors before then when they said hey do you want to switch over to neurosurgery because they had a spot 
And they were, it was sort of like, I didn't apply into it. They approached me because I was going into heart surgery. Um, then there's, I was like, well, can I, you know, well, let, let me just watch one. Because I, I hadn't seen one in medical school. And they like, they made an incision from your uh, sideburn across to your other sideburn, but behind the hairline. So, you know, it's not on your forehead that there's thoughtfulness to the hairline. And they're just like, da, 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 and they made these like little holes like you'd make in the wall, bzz, 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 like pep, like pep boys or Home Depot drills. And they, and then they took a jigsaw, like, you know, bzz, like you would cut out a, a cardboard, like the stucco and they were, and they chipped off and they cracked off the, just like the forehead with the sky. And I was like, is, I mean, is that even something that you're allowed to do and have the patient survive? And I'm like, past medical school it was that like crazy looking and then you don't see the brain right away the brain is that the, the beautiful brain that you're you're imagining from the movies it's covered with a sheath so it's almost like in a little sack like like a parachute material sack and then they lifted it up like with two uh, pickups like little tweezers and then they snipped at it and they un they unzipped it with a blade Ugh. and i looked and it was white no blood just like pearl oh, like it's not gray matter it looks like opalescent it was shimmery and white and had these little thin fine blue and red uh, arteries and i was like that's gorgeous i mean just from seeing something in a museum it was gorgeous it wasn't gray it wasn't bloody it didn't smell and the brain fluid was clear it looked like seven up without the fizz oh, and i was like where, where where in the body are we it's completely different than anything i had seen and I had seen leg surgery, pelvis surgery, heart surgery, lung surgery, neck surgery, and I was like, "This is this is, this is something. This is something to have the opportunity to potentially work in to help people. I will benefit in being a space that's like, whoa, a rarefied space, right? Like maybe that's how astronauts feel. And then I get to make people better, so I can take my competition, my competitive nature. I can take my fascination with being in a unique space and that I don't have any guilt with it because I'm trying to get you better. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me ask you this. When people are, when people need brain surgery, forgive me because it's again, not yeah, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. like what is the most common thing you see? What's the most common reason people come and in, in need help with the brain? Okay. That's, that actually takes me back to a bit of the story. So when I finished San Diego and I moved up here to city of hope, 2009, I was, I was, then I was 35, 36 years old. And I had written this handbook called 100 Questions and Answers about Head Injury. I liked, like, I liked doing stuff for people because I always felt like our world is not good at communicating. It's like, study your butt off, stay in the library all day to get the scores, and then we're going to put you in a hospital where people are doing drugs, they're fighting, there's crime inside the hospital, there's jail wards inside the hospital, there's CEOs there, there's business people there, there's homeless people there. I always felt like there was a disconnect, like we weren't properly trained for a human environment. And so I was like writing like book, little pamphlets and books. And then uh, Liam, uh, you know, rest in peace uh, with all respect. Liam Nielsen's wife had that tragic uh, yep. snowboarding accident where she fell. You know, if you snowboard, if you hit the wrong edge, it slaps you down hard. It's an unprotected fall. There's no like, I put my arm out and then my head hits. It's a very, it can be tricky. I don't know if she's snowboarding or skiing, but... So she had a brain hemorrhage. That's the number one reason. Uh, so when someone hits their head and has a brain hemorrhage. <clears throat> and a particular type of hemorrhage. Uh, most of the brain hemorrhages can be just watched. They're like a bruise. If it doesn't grow too much, the skull doesn't stretch, and the brain can handle a little gentle push. But if it continues to grow, it's basically like putting your fist into the brain because the skull will not give. In the belly, the blood will, if you had blood in your belly, the, the, your abdominal wall would stretch. So your guts are like, it's cool, the, we're expanding. But the skull doesn't stretch, so if you put blood in there, the brain gets smashed. And that is the number one reason people get brain surgery. Now that's different. That's just open up the, open the coconut shell. Let it out, let it... Let let the, it yeah, yeah. yeah, you're actually not in the brain, you're on the surface of the brain. And then what we do is when the cancers grow within the brain, they look like strange cauliflowers stuck stuck inside like a uh, strange cauliflower, like stuck inside a beautiful flan. And then you dissect a bit of the brain and you get to it and it feels different, it looks different. And then you don't just grab at it. And, and like other cancers, you don't 
take a, a, a normal cuff around it. It's weird. You go like an egg. You go right into the middle. You core it out, and then you collapse the shell onto itself. You don't want to bother the brain. And then you find out which corridors you can actually, parts of the brain you can go through, and you wake up fine. Other parts of the brain you go through, and they're injured. That's brain surgery. Which valleys and which corners can we slither in to get to the disease, get out, get out of town smooth and slick, and then the patient wakes up? Uh, that's brain surgery, not just a brain. Of course, it's brain surgery to remove the skull, but that's what we do with cancer. Brain so surgery. let me ask you this. So with a brain hemorrhage, do, how common is it people just don't know they're hemorrhaging? Well, I'm assuming that's, that's a good question. You know, I bet you everybody pops a little bit and they have a bruise or inside their brain and you don't feel it and a lot of people heal. But these days with all the scans, every time you got a headache, every time you get in a car crash, they're getting those scans in the emergency room. So we're seeing little ones. Most of them don't need surgery. The ones that grow or the ones that are growing fast, we jump in, open the skull. And let let it drain out and then put the skull. I always tell people out. when they hit their head, if they feel like they like they should just go get a check out. Because you never know. We we know a couple of people in our life that you hit their always head. tell people that. Are you a brain surgeon? No, yeah. I'm telling That's you. good advice no, though. I look at your teeth again. I'm not a brain surgeon, but I mean they should. But you know one now. No, yeah, and like I think there's a lot of people that just <laughs> yeah. don't know they're hemorrhaging. They end up they end up going yeah. the other way. There are, yeah, there's some tragic cases. What does it take to be a really really <laughs> damn good brain surgeon? Like, mm. it, does it take a steady hand? Like, what are give us like all the like tools that you need Inside in your toolbox? Stuff. I'm assuming first you have to look at it as a fruit basket and beautiful flan. Like that has to be yeah. the first priority. You have to like find it beautiful. Yeah, but I'll send you some pictures. There's some like there's stuff like well, Cause I'll pass the fuck out. <laughs> that's funny. No, but brain they got like stuff about like brain art and stuff. And I'll send you stuff. You'll be like, okay, that looks pretty. Um, what does it take? Who, who are the best? So, you ever see that movie Hurt Locker? Yep. And the guy's completely like, he's just got, he's got a lot of issues, but he has this unique thing where he can defuse bombs better than everybody else. He's calm as hell in the situation. Yeah. Whatever it is, it's like he's calm. Calm is one element. Uh, knowledge is another element. Experience is another element. You know, con commitment is another element. Having Good hands is one component, but it's not the thing that makes you a badass surgeon. A, 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 a badass surgeon is one that can take you out of unexpected danger. They're better. They're better. Okay, perfect. Not because uh, I, I mean, I was going to get too deep on that. Uh, not Einstein. But Captain Sully on the Hudson. I literally was just gonna Were ask you, gonna you are you Captain Sully? That's no, I exactly met him. I was, I was like, this dude should be president, yeah. man. Yeah. This dude is just. It's like you can land the plane calm. Well, but whatever he did, right? He flew for a while. He had it just that, like that elusive. You can't capture it. Uh, let's take a hundred people. Stoic. Yeah, stoic is one of them. But even if you freak out, if you pull it off, like I don't know how. What it, what is a two minute drill in football? Some of these quarterbacks are so good at throwing, but under pressure, two minutes, games on the line, some are better, some who don't actually have the better arm. And what, what Captain Sully did was interesting to me, really helped me understand was, and I saw him at KTLA because after Liam Nielsen's wife passed away, they actually asked me to come on, and that's been my like local gig. I go every Tuesday morning. I actually went this morning. But I met him there, and, and it was interesting that when we talked about it, you don't know you have that skill unless you try. And it's not the smartest ones. It's not the show-offs. It's, it's something you, you realize um, when you're put under pressure over and over again. Like, I want that guy to operate on my mom because the last 10 times the case kind of got out of control or you hit rough weather, man, he, he, they did better in his hands or her hands than the other people. And, and that, so that you have to be put to the test. And so ha steady hands is one of them. Knowledge is one of them. But that elusive, how, how, why, why if we both of us are given 10, 100 airplanes to crash land, you pull off 90 and I only pull off 60. Why, why did that happen? It can't be taught. It's not in a textbook. And that's why I love being a surgeon. Like, it's a physical performance. We work in an operating theater, right? It's a performance. It's, and, and sometimes we joke. It's like, I don't, you don't want you don't want to be you don't want a smart surgeon. You, you want a K 
capable surgeon. You know, there was a, my dad was a like part time pilot for a, for a, uh. a while, and he he had some training. And the, the guy that trained him was a he was an old like um, he was an old pilot, and he said like whenever there's a problem up in the air and you got to figure out like instead of freaking out and, and trying to make a quick decision, he's like take off your watch and start winding it. Like take that time as you're winding your watch to just think and be calm. And like I feel like it's those guys that have the experience being in some shit. Like they, you know, the guys that freak out and like mm-hmm. they can have all the training in the world, but when shit hits totally. the fan. And then once people are put under that stress, certain people show that they're remarkable. And it cannot be computed. It's not writing prescriptions. It's not making programs and software. It is a physical performance. So I always wonder about this. Like I have um, this surgeon came on that did my boob job. Dr. Barrett, shout out to him. And he, he is like amazing with how he, his precision, like everything. What if, like, you have a bad day? Mm. Or what if you worked out too hard? That's right. Or what if your wife just bitched at you? Like, what if, what if you have, what well, if, what three. if your parents just died? I asked him yeah. this question. Like, how do you go into surgery and operate on someone's brain and compartmentalize that? Yeah, so I don't, dimi- I don't, I'm not a guy that judges or diminishes. I just, like, I'm in my space. I'm, I'm hitting my stride. The interesting thing about plastic surgery is you get to see and have an opinion on, the success <laughs> but none of our whether you're here or at usc or cedars when we put the skull cap on and we see you afterwards you have no idea what the hell went on what yeah. the hell went on Whoa. Right? and that's so it becomes a real private club of people who operate inside skulls and hearts e- even the heart you can tell like oh wait you know i'm not having chest pain even knees you can tell like uh Dr. Josefina does the knee repair, and 98% say they feel better, and down the street, 96 With brain surgery, it's hard because you wake up, and it's like, am I thinking right? Am I moving right? It's a very fuzzy space that only other neurosurgeons can evaluate. So uh, what I would say is uh, for brain surgery, you want to you wanna ask the anesthesiologists <laughs> that are in the room, like, hey, but you guys can't get to them, which is a weird structure. But like, hey, man, who, uh, or what's going on and who's who's good? They would know. But with plastic surgery, it's interesting. The results are for you to uh, collectively <laughs> evaluate. And with w- operating inside cavities, um, the result is private. and sometimes can be mispresented to the patients, and the patients can't always tell. And the thing about plastic surgery like no no hate at all but um i like surgery where where it's dangerous because it brings something out of me um it brings a focus out in me so if i have a bad day or whatever it's actually strangely like like my meditation my golf my yoga it's like oh thank god i get to go to the operating room and shut everything out because this thing is going to get me just so jacked up and focused it's like when you drive fast, you're actually sometimes, well, I'm not encouraging people to drive fast, I'm just sharing my thoughts. Uh, when you drive fast, you are you have this like weird focus. I think, was it Robert Redford who mentioned that? It's like, what do you like? He's like movement and speed. Um, so a little bit of driving, a, a bit of attention to something else can actually calm the so mind. So stuff like this takes you out of yeah. what could be a bad day. Yeah, exactly, perfectly said. So the bad day, the stress, that's my escape. And uh, I'm not sure that's, that's true for all surgeons because here's the weird thing. When you you go into surgical training and they've never seen you operate. So if you took a, a thousand quarterbacks without seeing them throw and you would put all of them in a game, and I think that's where surgical training should say, look, you got to take videos. You got to show your performance. If you're average, then you got to do stuff that's not dangerous. And if you are talented, then we're going to put you in higher risk stuff. You know, there's like the flight simulators they would have for pilots and yep. astronauts. We don't have that. So uh, it's a it's a strange world that I'm trying to explain. Uh, but for me, the training was so rigorous when I was in my 20s, 40-hour shifts, easy. Come in Monday morning, 4 a.m., leave Tuesday night, 7 p.m., put in a full day on Wednesday, do it again Thursday morning, come back Friday. So the bad day, bad mood, um, you kind of learn your – you're, you're kind of, tra- I'm not saying that's the way I want it to be now, but um, if that's gonna, if 
you know, maybe you shouldn't be operating doing dangerous cases if if having a bad day or he's going to rattle you. If, yeah, if she's going to rattle yeah, you. Yeah, if I come in and somebody's, somebody's upset about their wife's then you're going to be operating. I'm going to freak the fuck out, you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> What do you do if you operate on someone and it doesn't go your way? Uh, I can't imagine right. every single case is, is like a win-win 100%. Yeah, that's a good question. That's proper. Uh, that's what I was mentioning earlier is that at some point you have to say, um, some, if, you do, if you go to the moon, you know, if, you, if you try to go to the moon, uh, some of the flights won't make it or be, they, there will be issues. And then so you then then that really messes with you. Like it took a long time trying to be like, man, this I was really, especially with the kids, like children's oh. children's brain surgery. There was a couple that I have stuck with me. Have you know, no question is PTSD. They just but I try to channel that into positivity. But um, so then that's where it comes in, where you have to in some way say to yourself, they need this. They can this the risk can never go to zero. But you, in your hands, it's the closest to zero compared to other people in town or other countries. And you, t- you start taking pride in being able to do things that others can't. Your hands are like a medicine that others can't get to. Um, and, and that's uh, so you take you start to you have to you have to realize you're going to hurt some people, but you're hurting them less than then if they went to, into other hands in other cities. And so like. Uh, next week I'm going to Bogota, uh, Colombia, and we're gonna. My buddy and I we do children's brain surgery down there, and so I need that to keep my mind fresh because this 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 city I love it. It's my town, but I need to see that too to see um, that uh, the ones that don't do well it was it it was it was just sort of this strange fate that uh, it wasn't something. It's never an oops moment. It's just. Some there's a certain percentage of complications you can't get it below that. If you if you fix a hundred Ferraris, two got to come back to the shop. What 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 kind of emotional toll does that take? In the beginning, it used to take a lot. Um, uh, you know, I had kids, then I then I had you know I had some complication with kids, and you, you, no matter how tough you are, uh, when you see a kid who can't move their legs and they came in moving their legs, and you were the one that said you know, you have some issues, and I. Uh, to, to protect you in the future, this treatment it happens to be surgery, but this treatment will uh, give you a better life, a longer life, a fuller life. And like the next day they can't move their legs, you're not doing, you, I don't know. And if you're not, if you're okay with that, then you should get out of, you know, you got to, you had the So pain. how do you cope with that? I don't know. Um, the pain is the uh, the motivator to get better. The, the nightmares about the people that you wish you could have done better for uh, is the motivation to get better. And then a decade later, um, you, you see what others do, and then you start to understand. Again, it's not an oops moment thing. It's just you can't, it's, it, you can't get certain complications down to zero if you're doing dangerous things. You can fly to San Francisco and ha- expect not to get in a car crash, I mean, an airplane crash, but you can't expect to go to the moon and land all 100. And then, then you start to understand, like, okay, the 10 that crashed en route, was that an oops moment? Or was, no, you were, everything, you were, you were, you were, you were flowing but you, the meteor hit or something happened. It's just an inherent risk to a dangerous, dangerous project. You know, who's articulate like you about this is, um, and he passed away, but the guy that wrote Breath Becomes Air, um, he was a surgeon that yeah, got yeah. cancer. He, and his wife actually has been speaking at schools and stuff like that. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd love to get her on the podcast. That was a great book. Um, I would like to know for anyone out there who's listening, if there's any symptoms that you recommend that people should go to a doctor if Mm. they're feeling in their head, like, is it a headache Mm. or, you know, a bruise or like, is there something like really weird that people wouldn't think is related to the brain where their hand shakes? Like, why should someone see a doctor? Okay. That's, that's actually, that's a really good question because the things that are dangerous are also the things that are super common, a headache. 99.9% 99.9% of headaches don't mean you have a brain tumor. Um, and so here, here's what I would say. I'll say three things. If you will go bottom up. If your leg hurts and there's shooting pain, that's one thing. But if you're trying to tell your foot to move or your leg to move and it doesn't listen to you, you got to go to the doctor. 
And in those situations, it usually doesn't hurt. So we, like after the after like the Super Bowl, we get a lot of people like my leg hasn't been moving for a day. It's not hurting, doc, but uh, it hasn't been moving for a day. Now you get a one day window for us to fix that. So not being able to move a hand or an arm or a leg without pain, pain brings you in, but don't ignore my legs not listening or my foot's not. Tapping. Like you're saying, go in right away because you have a oh, one, yeah. you have a small window. You got to go in before the Super Bowl ends. Because those nerves, if we don't open them up within like 24 hours, you've lost that for good. Oh, so shit. Then, so, so that's called, you know, uh, so if you have weakness without pain, it's still a big deal. Don't, don't think like, well, it's not hurting, so it's okay. The other thing is um, if you, uh, your speech, like strangely, like the brain is super global. It's not like the creativity lives here and fashion lives here. All that, all that stuff I read is just just not true uh, so we've done a poor job of explaining it and, and making it appealing but interestingly language is on the left side it has this unique neighborhood right here and that's why we do awake brain surgery to figure out like where everybody's address is for speech awake brain surgery yeah we, like the uh, person's awake yeah that's a trip too um holy for shit the patient yeah i wrote about that in the book but that's and that's been going on for 50 years yeah um now, so if you can't get the words out, and you're you're you can't get them out, or you're you're having trouble with language, or your face is droopy, that's what, and it won't hurt. That's also that could be a stroke. That's one. And the last thing is headaches. They hurt. How do you figure out if a headache's dangerous? I, I I'm not. I don't have a simple answer for that. But what I tell my patients is, if you have a headache and you do the usual things, and it goes away, you have an espresso, or you take your Advil or whatever, and it goes away. That's okay. Um, if you have a headache and that doesn't work and then the headache persists and it grows and it grows progressive, then you got to go in. That one is the one you want to pay attention to. If your usual maneuvers handle it, that one you can ignore. But if it's growing and your usual tricks aren't working with it, then that's something you want to get checked out. What about like a, uh, this is not to minimize this, but like a, a bad hangover, you know, cause it, sometimes you do things, but it just grows and grows. Is that because maybe like you're, you're dehydrated, like more. That's called you drink too much <laughs> fucking whiskey I'm, last night. I'm Michael. asking this selfishly. This is, this is, selfish is not question. for your audience. This yeah. is for yourself. <laughs> you drank too much whiskey last night, yeah. and your wife's yeah. pregnant and can't. Because those can, can have fun those can progressively get worse yeah. as you're awake. I mean, he's not going to yeah. operate on you yeah, if you're hangover. Fine. If you have a bad headache because you've been drinking, um, <laughs> what's the best thing to do if you've been like for the brain? If you've because you get bad headaches. You've been drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Water. Um, water for sure, because dehydration is a part of it. Mm-hmm. And um, something with like salt in it and stuff like that. Like so, uh, my buddies, their go-to thing is menudo. They get the soup and it's got like garbanzo beans and like. All right, we just went on the tangent, but the, yeah, okay. The tripe I want to talk like about that. your book, Neuro Fitness. I want to, I want to, because there's a lot of there's a lot of young people here. I was liking the tangent, by the way. Yeah, Well, it was Thanks a very so, bringing, listen. Bringing I, I have this show for a reason. I got to sit down with smart guys like you and solve my own problems. <laughs> you know. Um, okay, so. Your new book, uh, A Brain Surgeon's Secrets to Boost Performance and Unleash Creativity. There's a lot of p- people, high performers listening to the show, a lot of creative people. Let's dive into it. What are, some, what are some tangible things and steps that they can take to boost creativity and performance? Yeah, so how many chapters are in there? I think like 12, 13. The ones that have been working well, particularly in London, so just, just to go on another tangent. but Sure, tangent away. Um, when I... From KTLA, I got on this random Fox show, Fox Prime Time. It was called Superhuman, and the shot at CBS Radford. I was like, whoa. And I didn't have an agent at that time. They just called me at work, and I was like, oh, yeah, there must be another nursing home. I got to go check out a patient. And then my, my executive assistant was like, no, it's on Dahini. It's, it's on, I don't think there's a nursing home. And they, I met with Endemol, and they gave me this great opportunity, and I was on a cast, and, and it was uh, one season. But then – your world here, they they notice like, who gets on a prime time show uh, without an agent? This dude is this dude is random, right? Through them, I connected with WME Literary, which is just those you know the guy out there, Mel Berger's just he's just been so much fun. It, I know you don't think of literary as fun, but this dude is fun. He's been in it forty years. It came up from the mailroom. I had this idea. He did the magic of auction. I mean, the whole world was just I don't even know it. He drove it. And, and then somebody bought it from uh, Venetia Butterfield from Penguin. 
in London in UK. And she put a different title on it. Just changed the like album cover. Changed the title, changed the, the cover art, everything. And I became a bestseller in London. And what was it that what was the message that people connected with so much over there? She put the word storytelling on the on the cover, my opinion. So this one, the one you're looking at, the one we're talking about, it feels more like get at the airport and self help, and that's good too. But she put new stories of the mind. People are like, I want to hear stories because I don't. You don't want to be, you don't want Wikipedia, right? You want you want to learn. You're hanging. You're telling stories, and you're growing and you're learning. And that's each of these chapters starts with like a gnarly story. Oh, actually, that I that I wrote for Vice. So I wrote a gnarly story for Vice called "The First Time I Let Someone Die," because people are like. No, sometimes you make the decision that letting you die is the best thing. People they love that title. The first time I let someone die, that led to this. That led to that. That. Well, hold on, you have to just unpack that really quick. Yeah. The first time I let someone die, you wrote an article about that. When you say let someone die, what do you mean? Meaning they had uh, an injury to the reptilian brain. If the brain is a mushroom, the stalk that that is underneath the canopy, all those ridges you see. If you get an injury there, there's no there's no way to come back and. You have to explain that to the family to say, this one, there are no miracles. Um, God, that's going to be a brutal conversation. I was 27. Holy oh, shit, man. Yeah. And so, um, uh, that, so I wrote that. And I was like, okay, that's different. Because you know, everything is like, oh, you're saving lives. Saving, you have, you, you, the complexity of our gig has not been revealed yet. And so that, would, that, that got traction. And so back to the book, uh, over there is called Life Lessons from a Brain Surgeon, New Stories and Science of the Mind. Every chapter starts off with a vice piece, essentially, just like a raw four pages. And the chapters that have done well, because you wanted to talk about the book, were, uh, are sleep uh, and creativity. Uh, and let's just riff on creativity for a little bit, because this is the one that's really stolen my heart, because... You know, these tumors, they grow in the brain in different ways. They're not like squares inside of a circle. Like, I mean, they're wrapping around. It's, it's three-dimensional, like unimaginably. Um, and so what are the ways to be created? So there are the ways that are illegal, that pe- microdosing, psychedelics, and stuff like that. And the way that works is, think of it this way. You, your brain is only three pounds, but it sucks up 20% of your, your, of your fuel. I mean, it's just like an energy hog. So by design in its own way, it wants to form freeways to get to work, uh, put the kids to bed. In your mind, these pathways, these circuits, these like swarm of birds is the way I like to think of it. They get into these habits, how to get through the day without using parts of the brain they don't need to. It wants to be efficient because it's an energy hog, right? So it's always going down the freeways in its mind. When you take psychedelics, you shatter all the freeways and it's only roads. And so you have a lot of crazy thoughts, but you'll also have a lot of thoughts you wouldn't have had if you're just checking your emails and that sort of thing. That's the constant behind. It's not putting you in like a habitual path. Right, a rut. Yep. Like you, if you ski, ski or snowboard, there's a mountain, but there's all these lanes that everybody goes down. Psychedelics will take you down through the trees. That's not good or bad. I'm not trying to say do them or not do them. You're just, just saying that with like, it opens concept. what's somewhat limiting you. Um, is there like a, it's like, well, limit is a, is a, is that the right way to say it? Like a limiter or is it just, well, it takes you to thoughts you would not have in the brain's pursuit to be efficient, to tie your shoelaces okay. and get you home and check your email. Makes sense. Um, and you might get good ideas. You might get bad ideas, but that's where that psychedelic thing comes. But we are all wildly creative in our dreams. I mean, we're all tripping yeah. when we dream, right? So there, that there's a built in process for that. And then, so how to access that. I freaked myself out the other day. Fucking like really freaked myself out. I was dreaming. This is another tangent. But you know, they talk about this <laughs> mucus plug that pops out when the when the baby. And I woke up and I was like, yo, did your spark plug come out here? And I was, cause I don't know, I don't know what the hell I was thinking. Anyways, yeah. sorry, let's that, keep going. I wish but you I guys could talk, see I, the look between between the two. Well, because you. it just uh, you're talking about like I don't know what I was tripping on in that dream, but obviously something. So 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 back so then you go to dreams, right? So the concept of psychedelics are built in. So this is for like the people who are trying to enhance creativity. Like if you're thinking like, what does this do know about creativity? Well, if, if you saw what we do with three-dimensional work, you'd understand we're sculptors. Um, so we're wildly creative in our dreams. Can that be accessed? Can that, can that be put to use? And so there is, um, and then I started reading about all this stuff. So Salvador Dali, wildly creative, used to write about like the portal to his dreams was where he like put in work. Okay, and then I was like, oh, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. And then Thomas Edison used to like do this thing where 
he'd have be on like a uh, like just the back of a chair and he'd have a notepad and like when he was falling asleep he would uh he would write down what he was thinking at that right at that moment right and that's the basis of inception that movie with those mm -hmm. famous actors where um I can't remember their names. Christopher Nolan, Leonardo yeah, yeah. DiCaprio, yeah, yeah, and uh, and the other guy that I like, actually Tom Hardy, he's yep. got he's got he's got good energy. Um, they had that thing where they they'd fall backwards to pop him out of it. That's from Thomas's Edison's like trick to lean on a chair when he's falling, he'll startle himself. And so what there were what that what that is is there's a period when you are go transitioning from being awake to asleep that you are like partly dreaming but awake enough to write it down and so that transition is also when you go from having slept to waking up they're actually technical names for it, hypnagogic and hypnopompic and if you if you put these like electrodes on your skull like you you know people understand you put electrodes on your chest you can measure like the heart rate and stuff well electrodes on your skull stickers can measure electricity and there's their flow states it's aurora borealis it's not a computer swarm of birds you know and these there are these flow states there's typically one that you have when you're awake and there's typically one where you have when you're sleeping and so all the way from edison to dolly to inception there's like a 15 minute window when you're drifting off to sleep where you actually have those both of those waves and so there's a biological basis that you may have more creative thoughts if you uh think about things as you fall asleep and there's a caveat and then think about them again when you wake up. So the ritual for me is I got like my phone with the, the the notes app is ready or the Google Docs. And it can't be when you're exhausted. So you have to protect time to be creative, right? You can't be creative like when you're exhausted. Triple espresso, exhausted, hungover. You're not, things aren't going to be popping then. So you, what I do is I dedicate a day or two of the week where I know I don't have to wake up as early. And I'll take the puzzle in my mind that's been like, damn, like I've been working this for a while this tumor this thought the scientific thought and i'll read about it on a dedicated night and drift off sleeping about it and sort of imagine me running it in my mind in that in that dream factory in that psychedelic state that we have without the dangers of drugs and then i wake up i'll take some notes and does it work uh no not all the time of course not otherwise we'd all be wildly creative but i find that's where i get my good ideas in that in that process in that ritual so that's one way to enhance your creativity i call this when my husband goes cerebral uh he does i i allow him space to go cerebral i can tell when he needs to go inward and just like i get stuck in there he gets stuck no. in his brain and I, I say oh you're going cerebral that's good living though man that's because <laughs> i need time i need to like and it's not you know you know sometimes i'll just like kind of go in and just like what the hell i just need time to think you know yeah. and, th and so those those windows are there and then you're like okay so I would say that's one safe, uh, non-drug way to uh, consider changing the way you uh, do your creative process. The, and then some of the, uh, the other question I get from people, which I love, is, I mean, we, we, like, this it sounds like an overpromise. So can we all be more creative? This is a really, like, passionate concept for me. And the way, the way to think about it is this. The frontal lobes, those, those things behind our forehead that, that other animals don't have, um, they are so in command. They're like the air traffic controller. And what they're doing is they're, they're tamping down our wild side. Because you have to. You have to drop the kids off. You have to get to work, right? You've got to be efficient in getting the daily tasks done. Uh, so the, the windows to falling into sleep and coming out of sleep is one way. But we, I, it was this fascinating thing that when you damage the frontal lobes, uh, not on purpose, and that's not some strange experiment, but in Alzheimer's clinics and institutes, nobody wants Alzheimer's, I'm not going there, but you can learn about yourself from the ways in which other people's brains deteriorate. When you injure, well, in Alzheimer's, there's some, of, some people have this dramatic increase uh, in the ability to paint. Like they have shown art, and then like 20 years later, it's just better. And so the concept behind that is, and then some, sometimes people say, well, the alcohol, a lot of writers used to drink. If you can learn to have your executive functions of the frontal lobe um, take a back seat for a while, we all have the potential to be more creative. Kids' frontal lobes are not developed. They're creative. Okay? Alzheimer's patients, 
frontal lobes are starting to be damaged, they can display some increase in creativity. We know some people have been hit with lightning and all of a sudden something magical has happened, savants, right? So there is this latent wild creative side that is in our core brain that that is that should be tamped down otherwise we'd just be walking around like we're all on acid so to get things done the frontal lobes really developed and let us live life but they also now get in the way of us accessing those those that visceral mind which is where creative creativity comes from are psychedelics bad for your brain some people, uh, you know, I mean, I, I went to Berkeley, and some people used to trip hard, and they, they ended up having a lot of psychosis and issues and stuff like that. And I know Silicon Valley, which is weird, like computer people doing microdosing. Uh, I don't get that. I always thought of creativity as more of uh, writing, entertainment, graphic, graphic arts, you know, sculpting. But uh, psychedelics are illegal. But they're also – oh, that's, here's, here's a side riff, too um, – they're being tested at cancer centers in New York. I also think they're, aren't they testing for people with PTSD too? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And, and some of those tests and, are positive. And Molly, or ex, I mean, we used to call it E, but E, ecstasy. Molly, Molly was a marriage counseling drug, and it's not a true, just a psychedelic, but the ones they're testing on cancer patients, extremely powerful concept that, um, that mushrooms, shrooms, whatever you want to call them, um, that they help people, they help, this is, I, I just, this is the complexity of the, the brain that is rarely shared, that cancer patients sometimes struggle with the fact that they have grown something inside them that is eating them alive, right? This is what cancer is. You don't get infected with it. You grew it. Um, and it hurts to think about that. And you just feel the, the, the sometimes, and so they they call this an existential crisis. So in America, in New York, there are clinical trials at hospitals with, with, you know, that are looking at can shrooms in a controlled environment with a doctor help uh, patients be more at ease, mind ease, with the fact that they have cancer. And to me, uh, that's amazing because that, that starts to talk about the wow of the brain, not this is where creativity lives and this is where fashion lives and this is where, this is where your brain lights up when you look at Brad Pitt. You know, like that stuff is like, I think it's a disservice to us to uh, misguide us about this complex universe inside our skull. And so, like, what do you mean? They're using, like, peyote or shrooms to help cancer patients be at, you know, be at peace with the fact that they have a, a terminal cancer, right? Like, that, that kind of complexity is a story I want to tell about the brain. That is interesting. Yeah, right? Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So... Who do you think would benefit from your book? Is it anyone? Is it someone that's that's looking to get in the medical field? No, it's not for people getting into. That's a fair question. I'm glad you said that. No, it's for um, um, it's it's for anybody that wants to see themselves in a new light. You know, that's what I would say is that. Um, for example. Uh, there's stuff about creativity that you've probably never read before because that was my goal like dude I'm I'm not gonna just go and see what others have written and go on Wikipedia and, and put it in a pretty package like I did a deep dive there's this like nature neuroscience journal and I was flipping through stuff from 50 years ago to now and there's references to like like I said Salvador Dali and Edison so there's creativity there's sleep there's smart drugs stupid drugs and it's just a straight up uh it's just a straight up presentation, but it's done in storytelling. And um, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just trying to show you there's things I know about our brains that we haven't read in the media or on, in the papers and books. And you might see yourself in a different light. Well, if I need brain surgery, <laughs> I'm going to call you. <laughs> I think you're my guy. I think, I think, I think, you're, I think you're, guy. you're my soulie. <laughs> I appreciate that. You need a different doctor. Though. Yeah, I need a different doctor. Um, hopefully, just as important as the hopefully, brain like tomorrow, I need a different doctor. Uh, where can everyone find you, stalk you, get your book? Um, I, I, you know, I, I work at City of Hope Cancer Center. That, that's that's who I am. Uh, my that's they, they that's who I am. Um, uh, well, it's not who I am. I'm, a, I'm a dad of three teenage boys. Um. You know, husband, my mom's living with me. We got a new puppy. Like that's me. It's not on the resume, but my what 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 I do, my profession, my career, 
And what's most important to me is, is I'm a cancer surgeon. And actually, that's even more important to me than a neurosurgeon. See, like, people trip out like, oh, brain surgeon, brain. Okay. But to me, um, I'm a cancer surgeon. And I like thinking about the fact that I've cut cancers out of thousands of people. Like, to me, that's actually more um, identity forming than the rarefied air of neurosurgery. Because there's some neurosurgeons that were just like, ah, oh, they're not, you know, they're kind of, uh, I'm not, they're not all impressive. Yeah, you seem like a pretty down to earth dude. I yeah, mean, the cancer surgery thing is the, is the deep thing. And then, so I actually will tell people, I'm a cancer doctor. And they said, what kind of? Cancer surgeon. What kind? Well, cancer of the brain. So I'd rather start with, I'm a, I try to help people with cancer and then work to, uh, so, but I've been, I've been enjoying my um, Instagram account lately, which is, I put creative stuff on there, pretty stuff, non-gross stuff. And that's at Dr. John Dial. But there's nothing I'm trying to sell. Um, I, I, I'm, I have the privilege of being highly paid. My wife is employed, so I could just quit and do whatever I want. Uh, my kids are strong. They, they, they've come through puberty and adolescence and all of that nicely. So the things I'm doing with you right, like right now, I feel like is my next the next chapter in my life is to have people see uh, our world, the cancer doctor world, uh, also in a new light. Not well, it's important, man. Yeah. I mean, listen, we've done this will be 250 of these things. This is the first time we've ever had a conversation like this. And so it just goes to show you like how many people like, don't start, don't talk about this stuff and how many people that should. Yeah, I appreciate that a lot. What you're doing is amazing. I think everyone should go follow you on Instagram as long as I don't faint. It's not going to be stuff that I'm going to faint over. No, it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's beautiful stuff. It's like art and there's like trees and different things to show people that like the way you're, you got 90 billion neurons and what, some of them are shaped like, just like trees. Like the concept, can you imagine the branching in a giant tree is also similar to the branching inside your brain on the tiniest little neuron and the way lightning bolts are and rivers come down mountains is the way arteries are. Like there's this connection between, we, we are, we are atomic dust. So it's like, you know what I mean? It's all like lithium can help you with by being bipolar. And it's also like on a meteorite. So we, I'm just trying to let people know, like we, we are this, this earth. It's not like us on this earth. And that's what it's, it's trippy like that. It's, but there's no gory stuff. Well, what you do is very niche. It's very interesting. Thank you so much for coming on. That was one of my favorite episodes. W where can everybody find the book? If they're interested. It's just Amazon. Everywhere? Amazon? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. We'll Thank link it all you. out. Come back anytime. Thank Good you, brother. Luck.